i'm really excited to talk to you about helping so why is this important why why do we help why do we not i i'm kind of a glass half full kind of person so i'm not showing you any pictures of when we don't help but here's a lovely picture a local story that many of you may remember uh, about a young boy who was playing in the Indiana Dunes and fell through in a sinkhole. And what's really remarkable, beyond the fact that he recovered fully here at Comer, uh, thank you, Comer, uh, is that there were a large number of people who dug 24 hours a day until they got this young boy out of the sinkhole. Now, they were digging, and they could just as well follow his, his uh, path. They could just as well fall into this extended sinkhole. So they were doing it at great personal peril. And yet they did it, and there were, uh, there were dozens. They were relieving each other. So we're helpers. Are we, are we the only ones? Well, first of all, let's, let's look about Let's look at um, one of the cues uh, that tells us that another person needs help. And this, uh, the next picture came, uh, recently I was having lunch with a young friend and there was a bee buzzing around him. And he, he I don't know how he figured out that bees are scary, but he has. But look at the, Look at the expression, all right? No one taught him that expression. But does, what does that expression mean? It doesn't mean he's happy. That expression means I, I'm, I'm worried. I, I, we, we all told him, the bee's not gonna hurt you. We're not gonna let the bee hurt you. There was no relieving his anxiety, his distress. He's letting us know with that facial expression. And we read it as naturally as he produces it. So just one more example of that. Here is Zoe. And she is not having the best day of her life. <laughs> My friend Aaron Freeman is always um, urging me to have the best day of my life. And I'd like to, but, but Zoe, that's not, that's not gonna work for her. She's, her facial expression, her uh, posture, everything tells you she's an unha unhappy camper. And then, we don't need words to figure out the story. Now she sees herself and she's a very happy camper. The other reason I, I show this series of pictures is because Zoe's mom is this uh, young woman here named Inbal Benami Bartal, and it is Inbal's it was in Ball that actually uh, brought me to the topic of looking at helping. So she came to my lab. She, it was her idea. Um, I was lucky enough to, uh, to hitch my uh, uh, wagon on, and we've uh, found a lot of things. Now she's uh, moved on. She's uh, at Berkeley right now. Uh, she's going to be a terrific scientist. OK, so what did we do? Well, to try and figure out whether helping has some biological basis. In other words, why do we help? So one thing would be those people that um, dug through the sand to, to rescue that young boy, they did it because they're firefighters or because they were raised to um, think of others or because it's their religion or because for some other reason that's very cognitive, that's very human. And the, that's one possibility. But another possibility, and the one that we favored, was that, in fact, we help for the same reason that other mammals might help. Because we don't want to, uh, we don't want others to feel distress. And so to test this, and, and there had been some inklings of this, and certainly there are a lot of uh, anecdotal stories, uh, and some of you may send me these anecdotal stories later today, <laughs> I anticipate. So, um, so there's a lot of anecdote, but, but what we really wanted to do is to, to test whether mammals would, would help given the chance. And we don't want to go to primates. 
They're too fancy. We want to go to rodents. I don't like mice, so we went to rats. Okay. So what do we do? We give the rats a chance. No one else had really given them a good chance to, to show their stuff. Show us, rats. Show us that you care. Okay? So what do we do? We trap a rat. The rat, we know from a long, lots and lots and lots of studies, rats don't like to be in enclosed, trapped spaces. Who does? Okay, and then what we do is we get the free rat. The free rat is on the outside. And you can see, this is the free rat, this is the trap rat. And then we've designed this very fancy door, very, very fancy, which has two panes and only the free rat can open that door. The trap rat cannot free himself. So the free rat has to free him. And what happens, the free rat is not a rocket scientist, not a neuroscientist, not an engineer. And the free rat does not know where he has to go to open the door. He doesn't know what a door is. Okay, so, okay, I'm gonna check out this side. Oh, that didn't work. I'm gonna check out the middle. Mm, can't get in there. Ah, warmer. So what you're gonna see in the next um, video, what you can see in the next video is a rat on the fourth day of testing. And he had started to open on the second day of testing. They get tested for 12 days, hour, hour at a time. Uh, so he had opened on the second day, he'd opened that door, and then the third day he said, oh, that was fun, let's do it again. And on the fourth day, does it again. And that's what you're gonna see. So this is the fourth day, about the third minute. I have to also tell you that these rats are colored. We, we decorate them with magic markers <laughs> so that we can follow their movements using a computer program. Okay. They're albinos, so they can't see the color anyway. Uh, okay, here we go. So, what do you see? It's, it's still hard for him to do it. It still takes him some time, right? Even though he's done it, this is now his third time. He knows where the door is. He actually knows what movement he has to use, but it's still hard. We have to think like a rat, okay? We're all thinking like a rat right now. So this is a hard task for them. And one of the things that we know actually is if you just put chocolate into the restrainer here, uh, it still takes them four or five days to figure it out. Okay, so in the next video, what I'm gonna show you is something that we use to, we, we wanna say, okay, how important is it to you, rat, to open the door for your distressed cage mate? How, what's the value of that? So how can we ask a rat what the value is? Well, we're gonna compare it to something that we know they like, which in this case is chocolate. So there's two restrainers. In one restrainer is their cage mate who's trapped, and in the other restrainer is chocolate. And this is not a Sophie's Choice. You get to do both. And what we found is that they do do both. But oftentimes, as in the next video, here's our rat, and he's opening now for the trapped cage mate before they, and about 40 seconds later, they open for the chocolate. Okay? And they share the chocolate. A lot better than what my sister-in-law would do. <laughs> Don't mess with my sister-in-law. <laughs> chocolate. <laughs> okay. So, um, so this, this uh, convinced us and convinced many other people that helping is something that's worthwhile, it's valuable to a rat. And that it's so valuable, it's basically on a par with chocolate. So that was great, and um, we were excited by that. And at the time, one of the most common questions that we got from people uh, once we first published this was, well, what about strangers? All your rats are cage mates, so they know each other. What about a stranger? Are you gonna help a stranger? So I thought, no, there's just no way they're gonna help a stranger. 
So I, I said to a, an undergraduate, David Rogers, who was in the lab at the time, and I said, David, go down, figure out how you're going to do the experiment, go do the experiment, and tell me what, what happens. He goes away for about a month, and he comes back, and he says, Peggy, you know, I can't see a difference. They open for the strangers just like they open for a cage mate. So we scratch our head for a little while, and finally we realized that what we had done was we, we tested this albino rat with a stranger albino rat. Now you may all not know this, but um, laboratory rats went through what's called a genetic bottleneck. In other words, all the laboratory rats are derived from two or three individuals. A lot of generations later, but nonetheless, we're talking about a limited number of, of founding genes. And so that stranger albino rat is a stranger, but it's also kind of, you look like my fifth cousin and you kind of talk like my fifth cousin and you kind of walk like my fifth cousin. So I, I, I feel like I know you. So we said, okay, let's get, let's get away from that and let's, um, test uh, these albino rats with a different type of rat. And what we decided to do was to test them with these lovely black caped rats. So these are not albino rats. They have a white coat background and then they have this um, black cape on them. And they're, they're really spectacular looking. So what we did, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna tell you the, the result that we found, the first result that we found, which was that the albino rat will open and help a black caped rat who's its cage mate. Okay, no problem. But the albino rat will not open for a black caped stranger. All right, now we thought, okay, what's the problem here? Is it because you don't know that individual black caped rat? or is it because you don't know black cape rats in general? And so the experiment that we did to test, to, to dis, uh, discriminate between those two possibilities was we housed a albino rat with a black caped rat for two weeks, and then we rehoused the albino rat with another albino rat, and then we tested them with 12 strangers. So on the 12 days of testing, they see a different black cape stranger every day. And as it turns out, these guys are terrific helpers. So what's the lesson? It means that for the rat, knowing one individual of a different type is sufficient to convey helpfulness towards any individual of that type. Okay? So that was, for my, I, I was really excited by that result. That's really, a, to me, it's a hopeful result. It shows that experience can influence the biology of helping, and it can extend helping to other individuals that one may not um, necessarily have uh, met before um, to different types of, of individuals. But at the same time, it was a really perplexing result because it suggests that experience is everything. Well, if experience is everything, can genetics do anything in this regard? Well, so this is why it's really cool to have a model of helping in rats. <laughs> it's really fun. All right, so what did we do? We did an experiment in rats that we cannot do in people. We did the Mowgli experiment. On the day that these albino rats were born, we came in and we switched them over to the black cape rat litter. This is me and Tony Logley doing this on one day. I, I, I just have to say, this was one of the most fun experiments I've ever done in my entire life. It's a total blast. Okay, and I also have to say, uh, rat moms, stupendous. <laughs> they don't care. You, new pup, come on over here. Get on in on the action. Good, good going. 
So, so th this was a really, um, the rat moms were great partners to have in this uh, experiment. And so what we did was we, uh, we were really careful that these albino pups never saw another albino rat. We had barriers between the cages so they couldn't even see the other albino rat in the next cage. So all they saw their entire lives are black caped rats. All right, now the question is, what are they gonna do when they grow up? So uh, what are they gonna do with black caped rats? Well, you, they have grown up, they have always lived with black caped rats, so we anticipate that they will actually help black caped strangers. And that's indeed what we saw, okay? Lick, 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 I love you, I love you, I'm gonna help you, out you go. Okay, now, question is, what is this albino rat who has always grown up in a black caped rat environment going to do with another albino rat? The first time they ever see an albino rat. And what's the answer? Oh, that's a very interesting wall. Yes, indeed. <laughs> Let's look at that wall. <laughs> now, after a, after um, a little bit, we we have to we have to let them out of this restrainer, or else they kind of they get depressed about the whole thing. So, <clears throat> once the, we let them out, this uh, lovely albino rat, red one, did not let the blue one out. We did. And then what happens? This is how they feel about each other. Oh, actually, this is a this is a black cape stranger. So they fight, and the the fighting happened between albino rats that had never met a black cape rat and albino rats that had never met another albino rat. Okay, so they fight, and this whole uh, series of experiments tells us that in fact, the for the rats. Their identity, their helping identity, who they will help, derives from who they interact with, who they grow up with. There are no mirrors in nature, and instead, they are interacting with their, their litter mates, their mom, um, and others that are like them. And in, under normal circumstances, when we don't go in there and muck up the works, the individuals that they are surrounded by are also genetically related to them. So this is a beautiful um, example of biology producing a flexibility that you can accept and offer help towards, uh, uh, in, towards the individuals you find yourself with. It's this, we, we've got a lot of sayings in the lab, and one of the ones that we, we have toyed with is love the one you're with. So <laughs> it's not quite right, but. <laughs> so why, why is this really, what does this have to do with the brain? This is brain teasers after all. And I'm showing you this for a couple of reasons. It shows two of the things I love the most. I love the brain. I can't tell you why, but I do. Okay, here's our human brain. Here's a rat brain. And the other thing I love, I love Abraham Lincoln. <laughs> okay, so uh, I get to show you two of my things, favorite things. Okay, so here's the rat brain, and here's the human brain. And if we cut through the middle of each, we see uh, here's the um, human brain and this outer bit this outer bark or mantle, this is all cerebral cortex. This is neocortex, in fact. Okay, we got a lot of it. And here is the rat. And they have a little bit. They have just that. No folds, no sulci and gyri, just a smooth cortex. And in fact, um, I just have to show you this too. So this is just comparing all of our cortex, if you, if you slice up an entire brain versus all of the cortex, which is it's a little bit unfair, but there you go. <laughs> they don't have very much in, in the rat. So what does that tell us? It tells us 
that it's very unlikely that it's neocortex that is driving helping. The rat doesn't have much of it. Instead, what the rat has that we have too, what we have that we share with the rat and every other mammal is um, subcortical affective pathways. Why do we share that? Why, do we ha why, do we, why are we born with an ability to understand another person's emotion or affect? Well, because we're mammals, and we all go through a time when our very survival will depend on a social interaction, that original social interaction that we have to get milk from mom. Okay, we evolved that way. All the mammals evolved that way. This is our common mammalian inheritance, and we now use that not only during uh, rearing of the young, but we use it in our everyday lives to help others in distress and that to in turn increase social cohesion. So this, this is a very useful uh, function, not just during um, uh, young rearing of a family, but also in everyday life to avoid predators to find food, uh, to find shelter, and so on. In closing, I would like to urge you to love the brain like I do. <laughs> All right, uh, thank you very much. And, and, and I am going to say, we're going to have a NeuroMOOC picture. I know that there are at least five NeuroMOOC students here. We're going to have a NeuroMOOC picture after the panel discussion. OK, I'm happy to take any questions. Social interaction. More than one person might have a fact on someone's ability or someone's desire to help another person. Um, I was wondering if you've done anything with like two rats in a cage and see if they still want to help this time. <laughs> So there, there are two things here. Are you talking about recipro there's reciprocity? So if one individual helps you, are you more or less likely to, to, to help that individual back? That, that's one piece of it. And the other, and the answer is yes, we, haven't, we have not contributed to that. But there are, there are reciprocal models of helping. And yeah, there's a, there's a tit for tat there that, that works. But the other thing I think you might be getting at is what's commonly called the bystander effect, which is that if there's, and this, I have a blog on this, this is a very, this is a very interesting topic, but um, the idea is that if there are multiple people, that the likelihood of helping an individual in distress goes down. It doesn't go up, it goes down by a lot. And uh, you may imagine why that may be. We don't fully understand it. Um, but what I would suggest to you is to think about helping on many different um, uh, axes. So if we have a huge, what we call a parameter space of helping. So one of the, one of the, um, axes is what's the need is the need you know can you spare me five dollars so i can go see a movie or is the need i an earthquake just happened and i'm pinned under a a a fallen fallen debris one's gonna elicit more helping than the other another uh axis is the cost to me is it going to cost me anything? Is it going to cost me potential embarrassment in front of other people? Or is it going to potentially cost me my life? Um, or is it, OK, that's a freebie. That's easy to do. And a third axis is familiarity. So if my spouse asks me for $5 to go see a movie, I'm probably going to give that $5. But if a perfect stranger asked for that same $5, I'm probably not. So there are, there are, there's a huge parameter space, and, and all we've done with this rat study is study one little version of helping. <laughs>